Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and life coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Wednesday, May the 30th, 2018, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Your first daily dose of happy for the day. We're off to a happy start here on Wednesday. I, I was so happy this morning, Cindy. I woke up a couple hours early and went to work. How happy is that? <laughs> That's pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm actually happy in a sense to do it because I knew if I could get this chunk done before we got to this point of the day with the podcast, then my morning after that would go very smoothly. And I did. I got it done. I'm glad that I did that because if I hadn't, after the podcast, I would have been ripping my hair out with all the stuff that had to happen in about a two-hour period. But now, now we're in good shape. So, you know, this is going to be a, an early day, but that's all right. I'm okay with that. That's nice to have it behind you already, and it's only, well, I started to say it's only 7 a.m., but it's 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Right, um, right. But still so nice to have it already finished up. Yeah. that's. I, I was trying to think of that phrase when we talked, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and I still can't remember what it is, but it was, it's like just doing the, um, it's a really weird phrase is why I'm tripping over it. It's something like eating the frogs first or something. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Eating the frogs first. But, well, you heard it here first, folks. But, <laughs> but it has it has to do with just getting rid of the tasks that you're and I don't know if you were looking it sounds like you were looking forward to this task. You uh, bounded out of bed 2 hours early, but sometimes we have a task that we're not looking forward to and it had to do with like kind of getting that out of the way first and instead of like procrastinating about it. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, well, that that's of, what this was like really. That. That, that's yeah. exactly what this was because I can't say I loved the task that I had to do. Um, actually, it was to repair something that I messed up yesterday, and that never feels really great until you get it actually fixed. <laughs> right. But, but I got it fixed, you know, and, and uh, all of the people who are affected by it are happy now. So, you know, that's the good part of it. But I can't say I was really looking forward to it. Um, in fact, that ties into something that I'm working on, and I even uh, cued to Wendy yesterday that I may make this like a 30-day thing for myself. Um I, I still am dealing with times where, I mean, the, the the mirror exercises have been great. They helped me get rid of a lot of the negative self-talk. All, all the negative self-talk that was just popping up on its own is gone. And some of the negative self-talk that I pop up is gone, too. I, it's, but some of it still pops up still. And some of it pops up... Um, most of it that that most of the stuff that still pops up happens because I'm not liking something about a situation. And mm. I allow my not liking of it to, you know, affect my mood and affect the way I'm thinking about things. And and I have I, I think I kind of reached a point where I'm I'm tired of that to the point that I, I want to do something, you know, beyond what I've done so far. It's like, okay, I'm drawing my line in the sand and to heck with this. I, I am just done. I am so done with this, you know, reacting badly to stuff that I don't like you know, what it is. I, I, I want to change my reactions and get better results out of it. So this morning was really kind of like a first test in that direction. Because here I had this task I really didn't want to do. But I was determined to wake up and, you know, look at the fact that, boy, if I can just really plow through this, I can get a task done in an hour that would normally take three. You know, because with the three hours, I would have taken an, an hour to procrastinate and then you know, half hour to do part of it, another half an hour to get upset about it, another half hour to do the other half, and then another half hour to recover at the end. So, you know, I basically replaced the three hour process with the one hour process. And boy, that's a whole lot better. <laughs> and, you know, I used to be a very, very early riser. And naturally, I still would want to be. Um, but we talked about that. The doctor said, well, your body heals its adrenals, especially between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. I used to like to be up at five. And I got so much done, and I, I think part of the reason why was because when I was up at five anyway, it was so quiet. Yes. Like, no one else was up, and the phone wasn't going to ring, and yes. there wasn't a, there just wasn't, and even though, you know, it's not like if I get up at any later that my phone's ringing off the hook and <laughs> there's a crowd of people in the house, but for some reason, it's just that really early morning quiet time seemed always to be super productive. Like, I really like being up that early. And when you were talking about eh, not really looking forward to the task and f not liking your response or reaction to when you're having to face something you don't like, I started thinking about the positive aspects when we were reading about that in this book. Mm -hmm. And no sooner was I thinking about that than you started actually saying it because you were like, well, <laughs> 
once I get it done, it'll be great. And I could plow through it in an hour instead of three. And I'm like, okay, there's the positive <laughs> there aspect. <it> is. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. Well, that's just it. That's what I'm trying to put into practice. And we, we talk about stuff a lot here yep. on the program. And, 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 you know, just in private life, people do that. We talk about stuff. But how much do we actually implement it? And that's it. You know, I, I, I think that's what it is. Somehow I have gotten to a point where I am tired of not implementing it. As weird as that sounds, that, that I, I kind of reached the breaking point on that. Like, no, I, I'm just done with this stuff. I, I want to actually have all good days. And the only thing that's stopping me from doing that is me. So <laughs> how about, you know, actually walking the walk, not just talking the talk? So well, I think that we all we get interested in things and we do a lot of study and maybe a lot of reading and a lot of talking about it and learning. And so we've got all this information. <laughs> yes. And I think there are a lot of us who we have so much information and so much knowledge about this stuff in theory. And then but then we have to actually use it. You know, you can memorize the whole recipe book. But if you never go into the kitchen and bake the cake, um, you're still not going to have a cake. And so I remember one time I felt like I was looking for a book on something and I, <laughs> I felt like I got chastised by my higher self pretty hard. It was like, oh, no. I'm not going to say I heard an audible voice, but <laughs> but I, I got a really strong sense of, you don't need another book. Like you can teach <laughs> this stuff to anybody. You need to just, just use what you know already. Just learn the, th just do the thing, just do it. It's time to put it into practice, you know? And I'll, I'll never forget that. I always think about that when, you know, I'm taking, I mean, I will never stop learning because I love to learn new things. So I'm a, what would be called a lifelong learner, I guess. Learning stuff mm -hmm. is sure. great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's like, okay. And I like the way you said, I might make this a 30 day thing for myself, sort of like giving some structure or a plan to an actual intention. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want to do. And in fact, I, as you're describing that, I realized Mike Dooley had a really nice metaphor for what we're talking about here. Um, he talks about how when you're doing something like this, when, when you, you're taking some kind of action, usually hopefully an inspired action, um, it's kind of like taking a trip. And so it's like you get into your car and you sit down in the car and uh, you're all excited. You're excited about where you're going to go. You know where you're going to go. You got the vision boards in the back seat, the secrets on the seat next to you. And you forget to do one thing. You forget to put the car in gear. <laughs> and you don't go very far when you don't put the car in gear. Right. So you're just sitting in the driveway. Yeah. Wondering like why that. it's taking so long. And then after it takes so long, you know, because you aren't going anywhere, they say, well, this doesn't work. And you take the vision board out of the back seat. You take the, the book out of the oh. side seat. You walk back in the house. And you start watching the secret all over again. <laughs> Right? Right. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's so true. So, so true. Well, it's I'm, crazy. I'm excited about uh, the section. And when, you know, when we talk about the title, it doesn't maybe sound like something that a person would be excited about. But yeah, this is a little tough one, but it does have yeah. some interesting stuff associated with it. But I've, I've, it's one of those things that, you know, people often when we start to learn about law of attraction, we have questions and some of the questions are about things that seem like we didn't cause this thing to happen, right? So what about these things, you know? And of course, a lot of times those questions go into the the big hard questions about, well, but what about when a tiny child is having a problem? Or what about the Holocaust? Or what about, you know, certain things that they're, they're like, I'm, I'm not responsible for causing this. Um, but this is about traumatic injuries. I, I want to comment on that for a moment, too, before we get into the traumatic injuries section. The fact that we as human beings are really, really good and really, really inclined to go look for extreme cases as yep. a way of justifying not accepting a new idea. It's, that's what, it's true in every phase. I mean, every in every, phase. you know, yep. In fact, that's what philosophy is about. By the way, <laughs> if you ever take a course in philosophy or pursue a degree in philosophy, all philosophers are consumed with the idea of how do you not justify taking on a new idea? <laughs> I mean, they, they, will, they wrote for like pages and pages on the subject. 
and here's why you should accept it, and here's what, you know, th this is why it's the wrong paradigm, and, and this is why you're, you're, you're really on the wrong track and so forth. This is what philosophers write about. Which I really proves that it, it, I do too. <laughs> I, it was it was an informal minor for me, and yet isn't that what they do? I mean, yeah. how often do you actually see a philosopher, of, especially a classical philosopher, who wrote something that was just inspired action thrill? None of them. No, mostly it, it sort of feels like a slog. Until, it does until you you have that sort of aha about it, and I think that's what's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what draws us into it. Yeah, because occasionally right. we get the aha. But look what we're willing to put up with until we get it. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> so, so we're working our way through uh, money and the law of attraction, learning to attract wealth, health, and happiness. And we've we've covered the, the kind of ground rules of um, filling our toolbox. And then we moved on to attracting wealth. And now we're in the middle of the book, which is which is about well-being and health. And this section today in the paperback, we're on page 109. This section today starts with a question. What is the role of thought in traumatic injuries? What, what are the things that Wendy and I do whenever we get these conversational passages is I'll read the Jerry part and she'll read the Abraham part. So you want to read the Abraham part? Oh, yeah, that works fine. Okay. So All Jerry, right, so said, you're up. I'm up. Here <laughs> I go. Jerry says, are traumatic injuries created in the same way that diseases are created? And can they, be resolved? can they be resolved through thought? Are they like a breakage of something that happened in a momentary incident as opposed to a long series of thoughts leading up to it? Oh, I'm, before I read Abraham, I just want to comment because that's a really interesting question phrased that way. It is, yeah. Because we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how constant complaining about things and not necessarily about health, but complaining about anything that it eventually show, shows up or can show up in the body as disease or or some kind of, you know, sickness. And so this is this is interesting because this this really isn't generally we don't think of it that way. No. A, tra a traumatic injury. We don't think of. Yeah, I've been complaining a lot. <laughs> it was leading <laughs> up to this. Okay, so Abraham says, whether the trauma to your body seemed to come suddenly as a result of an accident or whether it came from a disease such as cancer, you have created the situation through your thought and the healing will come through your thought as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chronic thoughts of ease promote wellness. While chronic stressful or resentful or hateful or fearful thoughts promote disease. I think it's important that we stress it's chronic. Mm. Right? We all have thoughts that may fall into those categories once in a while. It doesn't mean it's a chronic thought, though. Uh, chronic thoughts of ease promote wellness. That's the one we want to go for. While well, chronic well there, is, there is one thing I want to comment on there. And that is, you're right, any one given thought doesn't make it chronic. But, and this is, I think, an important but, just because we don't have a series of thoughts on one subject that isn't chronic doesn't mean that we don't have a chronic pattern. It's quite possible, and I think it happens a lot, for people to have a lot of different thoughts that are seemingly unrelated, but they all have a negative or an un unpleasant or, or undesired aspect to them. And so Absolutely, can... and that because that that's an energy level. Yes, exactly. So, so if we're resonating with a lower level of energy, then we may absolutely have a lot of different thoughts on different things, but they're all going to be in that energy range, which is whatever it is. So, so it, yeah, it's like absolutely. generally chronic as, as yep. opposed to specifically chronic. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Good point. Uh, but whether the result shows up suddenly, as in falling and breaking your bones, or more slowly, as in cancer, whatever you are living always matches the balance of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Once you've experienced the diminishment of well-being, whether it's come as a broken bone or internal diseases, it's not likely that you will suddenly find good-feeling thoughts that match those of your inner being. In other words, if before your accident or disease, you were not choosing thoughts that aligned with well-being. 
It's not likely that now that you're faced with discomfort or pain or frightening diagnosis, you will now suddenly find that alignment. Of course, that's when we expect to find it. Yeah, well, it's when we care about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, when we say, okay, I got to get in alignment now. Well, probably better to have done it before. Yeah, it's much, it says in italics here, it's much easier to achieve great health from moderate health than to achieve great health from poor health. However, you can get to wherever you want to be from wherever you are. If you're able to distract your attention from the unwanted aspects of your life and focus upon aspects that are more pleasing, it really is only a matter of focus. Sometimes a frightening diagnosis or a traumatic injury is a powerful catalyst in getting you to focus your attention more deliberately on things that do feel good. In fact, some of our best students of deliberate creation are those who have been given a frightening diagnosis where doctors have told them that there's nothing more that can be done for them who now, since they have no other options, deliberately begin to focus their thoughts. Oh, it's I, just want to, I want to stop one moment there because I, I value what they're saying, but I want to also point out the value of the part that they're skipping over um, because they're talking about how, they, here's the quote, some of our best students of deliberate creation are those who have been given a frightening diagnosis. That's good. But guess what? They're not the only good students. They're not the only best students. There are other best students who decide long before they get a frightening diagnosis to be applying deliberate, deliberate creation, taking the principles of deliberate creation and applying them in their lives and doing so in order to remain healthy. The, the, that's the only thing I can, I, I'm a little concerned about with this passage because the hint here, the, the underlying suggestion is you're a best student if you do it when you've gotten the frightening diagnosis. But why not right. also so be a best really, student before then? Yeah, so it's really important to notice that it just says some of our best students. Exactly. Right. Exactly. exactly. And, and it's interesting it, <laughs> that this last paragraph is interesting that so many people will not do what really works until all other options have been <laughs> yes, exhausted. there you go. <laughs> and, you know, it's, even though it says so many people, I think all of us have had some situation where oh, yeah. we just didn't you know, just didn't do the work until we just didn't have a choice. Uh, so it's interesting that so many people will not do what really works until all other options have been exhausted. But we do understand that you have acclimated to your action oriented world. And so action does seem to be to most of you to be the first option. We are not guiding you away from action, but instead encouraging that you find better feeling thoughts first and then follow with the action that you feel inspired to. So once again, we talk about this every time we do we the do. podcast. It seems mm -hmm. alignment first. Alignment, alignment first. first. Yeah. And um, by and the way, I, like I mean, the way, they, oh, go ahead. You'll finish. Well, no, I like the way that they said you've become acclimated to your action oriented world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gives me a little bit of comfort realizing that, okay, you know, <laughs> in other words, it's normal and natural for us. We live in a world that's very action oriented. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's just a natural thing for our first thought to be what can, I mean, people say this to me all the time as a coach, right? I probably get this question every day from someone. What can I do? Mm -hmm. What can I do? Um, we, we're action oriented. We're always trying to figure out well, what, what do I do about this? What do I mm -hmm. do? And doing is, work and being is effortless so it's really the question is much better asked is who can i be right mm. <laughs> so write this this alignment first <laughs> we are not guiding you away from action but instead of encouraging that you find better feeling thoughts first and then yep. follow with action that's inspired i i love that and what so you're describing you and, and what abraham was describing they're, they're differentiating between actions and thinking. And that's, a, that's understandable because you have to differentiate between them. But I think there's also something that we can kind of do a little pivot to in order to, to f get ourselves into a better place of focusing on the thoughts. Because I think of thinking as an action. I mean, it's not a physical action. But it is an action. It's something I have to do. In fact, I was talking earlier about how I, I got to put a 30-day program into place with structure. Well, guess what? That's taking action. Now, is it 
getting up and walking around? Is it waving a pencil? Is it you know typing on a computer? No, but it's still taking action. So, I mean, it's important to differentiate just so we know what we're talking about. But for those who want to take an action, why not take an action that involves in taking control of your thoughts? That is a form of action. Well, like I said, I, I love yesterday. Um, I was commenting on you rounding up the authors of the book for the for the Kindle launch and encouraging everybody to talk about it and share about it, which of course that's what you do in a book launch. You go right. tell people that you've got a book out. Yep. But the wonderful thing was that you made sure to say, once you're really excited about the book and you're in that high flying emotional area, then share about it. And yes. I was like, there we go. That's alignment first. It is. And it it's is. not the thing we always do. And, and it's, when we're talking about the body being in pain, um, when we've already gotten ourselves to that point where we're feeling discomfort or disease, or this is like a traumatic injury, to get into the high flying place is a little bit more work. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's a different kind of action, but it's still an action. And, and, and it, once I started treating it as an action, like the mirror exercises, you know, I talked at the very beginning when I first started that and at, right after you told me about it. Um, I talked about how in the past I hadn't really done very well with these kinds of things. And I realized now that why it was. The reason I didn't do very well in the past is I just relegated them to thought. I didn't figure I had to actually take some kind of an action, even a mental action. It wasn't until I decided, okay, I am going to make myself take the action of getting up every morning and going to the mirror and doing the mirror exercise. That's my action. That's, that's on my to-do list. And when I treated it that way, then it fit right in nicely with my action-oriented beingness. That's what I am as a human being, right? I'm an action-oriented being. Well, I turned it into an action. See, I love that. I love that you said mental action. Um, and yeah. what I see about it is that it's and we you're going to hear this word so much anytime you're reading Abraham Hicks, but the word deliberate. Yes. The word intentional. Yes. Uh, conscious creation. Mm -hmm. So we're all creating everything all the time in our experience anyway, but most of us just aren't doing it consciously. We're not doing it deliberately. We're not doing it with intention. And so when we say something like, let me think about this, <laughs> right? <laughs> when we say, let me take a moment. Let me take some time today to make sure I'm in alignment first. Then I think absolutely we are turning that mental focus into an action, yeah. into an action step. It is. It's like it becomes something we are doing. What should I do? You should get into alignment. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's how we make <laughs> that's it habitual. My answer to that. That's probably already my, been my answer many times. But yeah, <laughs> I like the way you said once I relegated it to an action, once I made it into I think we've made it worthy of it being an action, right? Yeah, yeah, we really have. <laughs> and, and it's good to do that. And in fact, how many actions do we line up for ourselves that really aren't terribly good for ourselves? We do it because we have to or because it's expected of us or something like that. Isn't it nice to line well, up an action that's yeah. actually good for us and that feels good? The other thing I feel is like, I don't know the word to use. I kind of want to use the word permission, but in other words... You just use the word should, right? Oh, I guess I should do this. Yeah. yeah. Like an, an action that we don't, it's not inspired. It's something right. we th we're doing because we think we should. Um, and when you realize that if you're not feeling really great about it, then you probably shouldn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then it's sort of like permission. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get alignment. I'm going to get alignment going here. And then, then I'll feel better about doing whatever it is. And so I think, I think it's actually, it works in my favor to recognize that it's okay. I have permission to hold off on something because it's not feeling really good. Yeah, and even if it's I, only five minutes, just the five minutes it takes to get into alignment. But yeah, hold it off. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about is that I have permission to put it on the docket for, for at the time when I'm feeling great about it and then go work on alignment and come back and do it. Because alignment doesn't actually take that long, interestingly no. enough. I no, mean, not if you if not if you just do it. <laughs> I mean, early on, it it took forever. I mean, it took months, literally. <laughs> the first few times I tried to do it, 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 I can't tell you how many months it took before I finally was able to move the needle, because I really didn't know how to do it. 
So well, the first we time it took a while, about... but but after having done it for a while, then it becomes amazing how quickly you can do it. it. It's not like there's this long transition period between, okay, the first time that I managed to move the needle and then now being able to move it within five minutes. That transition is actually pretty quick. It's the time of you know getting that first movement. That's the one that takes the hard amount of time. <laughs> Well, it's important to remember, too, when we talk about alignment, we're not talking about you forcing yourself to like something you don't like. Right. Or pretending that it's good when it's not. Well, that tripped me up more than anything. That's actually what stopped me. That's what kept me, you know, from getting there in the first place. (laughs) Yeah. And so that's important to recognize that is not what we're talking about. No. Um, No, because that, oh, that never works. All right. So the next little section. we We should finish up by saying what does work. What does work is to find the better feeling thought about it, to pivot. So when we say, oh, I don't like this, instead of pretending, oh, I, yeah, I like it. It's great. It's okay. <laughs> or or deciding, okay, I guess I'm going to learn. You've heard people say, I guess I need to learn to like whatever it is. Yeah, fake it till you uh, make it, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is recognizing that you don't like it. That's fine. It's fine to recognize it. And sometimes it's a powerful action in itself to be honest about, yeah, I do not mm-hmm. like this. I don't mm-hmm. like the way I feel. I don't like the way it's working out. And then pivot to what you do want there and why you want that. What, what is it that pivot, I like? I already know what I don't yeah. like. What is it that I do right. like? And even in your situation today, like you were faced with, oh, okay, I have this task. I'm not really looking forward to it. Well, what do I like about this? Mm-hmm. Well, it's going to be great to have it done. That's right. And that was it. <laughs> it's early and quiet. And I realize that if I do it now, I'm going to get it done in like a third of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of a sudden now, even when I talk about your experience, it's like my energy shifts. Because, <laughs> right. That's the process of you will feel the energy shift when you start to get into alignment. When True. you start to talk about the positive aspects of it. And what it is that you do want instead of what you don't want and why you want that thing and what you're looking forward to and what it's going to be like when you have it. It's that little bit of an energy shift. It doesn't have to be huge. And for those who who are like where I was, because there was a time when I didn't feel the energy shift. I didn't know what what to feel for, so to speak. The energy shift is feeling better. When you feel better, you've had the energy (laughs) shift. So there's your there's your guideline. If you have if you feel better, you had an energy shift. Now you know what you're feeling for. I'll tell you something really interesting to do that it's this is really powerful. It really works. Um and that is to assign um a unit of measurement to a thing, right? So let's say a like a scale of 1 to 10. Even in, even in the emergency room on the wall, there's sometimes a chart that has a scale of one to 10. It has little faces that go from grimacing to happy, right? It's like they mm-hmm. ask children, okay, where, you know, this pain you have, where is it on that scale? If we assign a, a number to a thing, and I do this with, um, well, it's, it's really great. And we're talking about physical well-being. So it's really great with pain. And it's not something you ever overthink. It's just a quick, intuitive answer, right? So it's like, my head hurts. Well, where is it on a scale of 1 to 10? With 1 being there's no pain at all, and 10 is like you think you need to go to the hospital, you know? Right away, most people will say, oh, it's a 3, or it's a 6, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then once you, and you can do this with energy. You can do this with how do you feel about this? On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about this task? With 10, you want to walk away from it and never come back. And 1, oh, it's okay. You're looking forward to it. Oh, I'm an 8. I don't want to do it. Um, once you start doing alignment, then you can say, okay, where are you now? (laughs) Yeah. And you can see the number move. And that's one way when you can't feel it in your body, uh, to, to see how much it shifted. That's a good point. Yeah. Because we can often identify a number, even if we can't identify the feeling. So yeah, that's good. I like that. So where are you feeling so, on, one, on a scale of one to 10, like one feeling no pain and 10 means you're about to drop dead. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, and it's in, it's interesting to, if you use a scaling question, you know, with your, when you're doing it with yourself, sometimes you can just easily just not even define it, um, but just choose a number. Right? Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, because it's all relative anyway. So no matter what number you pick, it's just a question of, okay, is it a lower number or a higher number after that? Right. It's just a question of move that number towards what feels better. It's like we said right. yesterday. It either it either feels better or it doesn't. Yeah. If it's neutral, you haven't moved the needle. That's it's it. It's just we want to feel better. So speaking this next of, section, could a congenital illness... Before you get into the Be next by... section, before you get into the next section, okay. I, there's one thing I do want to mention because we, we've been working really hard on the book lately and getting the book out and it's out and people are reading it and we love that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Our book we're talking about. Our that book. that title. <laughs> yes, different book. Not the one that we're looking at right now. Right now we're looking right. at Money and the Law of Attraction, but our book, Your Daily Dose of Happy, the, the Real Success Stories of the Law of Attraction, that book is out now and, and we're excited and, and we're hopeful that it's going to bring more listeners to us and, and that uh, we're going to to keep building the audience for the books, for future books and so forth. But I don't want that to overrule the fact that we still want people to subscribe to the podcast. So let me just take a moment to say, if you are new to us, if this is one of the first episodes you've listened to and you have not subscribed, just take a moment and go to the homepage at LOAToday.net. You'll see lots of stuff there. There's lots of really good information. But one of the first things you see right below the player is how to subscribe to the podcast. And it's fairly simple. The instructions are right there to describe for whatever device you're using. But it really does pay off because people who are subscribers listen to, according to our statistics, somewhere between 30 and 45 episodes a month. And basically that means that they're playing it, you know, when they're driving to work, when they're driving home from work, when they're, you know, cleaning around the house, when they're hanging out at the beach, when they're, I mean, they're just doing it as part of their lives. They're listening to it on their smartphone. Well, we encourage you to do the same because the reason they're doing it, the reason they're listening to all these podcasts is because it helps them feel better. It helps them move that needle. It helps them do exactly what we've been talking about here for the last 30 minutes. And, you know, that's a benefit that anybody could could uh, benefit from without being too redundant. <laughs> I mean, we all need to feel better. We need to do it on a regular basis. Well, what better way to do it than with a daily dose of happy? So please subscribe. Yes. And please share, subscribe. lots of share buttons there. And uh, we just want to welcome, welcome you on board as a longtime listener. Yes. And also, if you're listening live at any time, you're listening live, you can call in and join us. And the instructions to do that are on the, on the website, too. Absolutely. Both instructions are right underneath the other, or right there on the homepage. And we love to hear from people. We love it when they email us or use the contact form, but we especially love it when they call in because we get to talk to them. We get to find out what they're like. That's really great. I don't know. I mean, you guys hear us all the time. You get to know us, uh, especially if you're subscribed. Another hint to go subscribe if you haven't done that yet. <laughs> but, you know, so you guys get to know us, but we want to know who you are, too. So whenever somebody calls in, we just love that. It just feels so good. It's like, oh, wow, we're talking to a live listener. This is great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so say hello. <laughs> yeah, Comment. absolutely. All right. Uh, I don't okay. want to rush you, but are no, we ready? <laughs> yeah, we're ready. Go on to the next section. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The sub the subtitle here: Could a congenital illness be vibrationally resolved? So, Ooh, boy, Jerry, that, that's an interesting prospect. Jerry says, "Can a congenital illness, something a person came into physical form with at birth, be resolved by thought?" And Abraham says, "Yes." From wherever you stand, you can get to wherever you want to be. If you could understand that your now is only the jumping off place for that which is to come, you could move quickly, even from dramatic, unwanted things to things that please you. Oh, I feel like I need to read that again. Mm. From wherever you stand, you can get to wherever you want to be. If you could understand that your now so our present moment mm -hmm. is only the jumping off place for that which is to come. You could move quickly, even from dramatic, unwanted things to things that please you. If this life experience contains the data that causes you to give birth to a desire, then the wherewithal to accomplish it is available to you. But you must focus upon where you want to be, not where you are or you cannot move toward your desire. However, you cannot create outside your own beliefs. So in that paragraph is That's a both, lot of stuff there. <laughs> well, it both details that yes, you can make a change to a congenital condition and it also describes why it is most people don't. All in the same paragraph. Well, yeah, and I think one of the reasons people don't is because of that uh can't not being able to create outside of our own beliefs mm -hmm. 
I mean, that, that stops us faster than anything. If we don't believe it can happen, um, then uh, it's probably not going to happen, right? And, and it's Wh- not surprising. It I mean, if you've got a congenital condition, that's what you've always experienced in this life. So, right, and then know, we we have words like incurable. Incurable, oh yeah. Right, we have we have definitions and words that describe things that play into our belief about it. That says, well, this is how it's always going to be. So what? So that makes a lot of sense. So then, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to recognize that you've got a lot to overcome in your mind, because that's really what we're talking about here. When we change our thought pattern, that's what. Uh, ends up producing different results in our lives that we're looking for, hopefully that we're looking for because we're focusing on the right thoughts. <laughs> but the point is, when you're in that congenital place, you know, you 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 have this congenital condition. You were born with it. You know, you will always have it, according to all the experts. Well, there's a lot of negative thought there to overcome. There's a lot of thought process, a lot of beliefs, built-in beliefs to overcome. And so yeah. that alone can take a while just because it takes us a while to get through them, you know, to kind of identify what they are and put them aside, and replace them with other stuff and so forth. And in the midst of all this, live with the constant reminder of, oh, yeah, the congenital defect still there, still there. Yep, I just checked, still there. That's a lot to overcome. Can it be it done? Is. Yes, but it can be done. Yeah. So major diseases come and go, but why? Jerry. <laughs> Sorry, hang on a second. I just had a a little bit of a choke, so I had to get some water. So Jerry says, in my earlier years, there were major diseases, tuberculosis and polio, that we hear very little of anymore. But we're not short of diseases because now we have heart disease and cancer, which we almost never heard of back then. (laughs) In those days, syphilis and gonorrhea were constantly in the news. We don't hear much of those, but now AIDS and herpes stay foremost in the news. Why does there always seem to be more diseases cropping up? As cures are being discovered, why don't we finally run out of diseases to cure? (laughs) Good question. It's a great question. Uh, Abraham says, because of your attention to lack, feelings of powerlessness and vulnerability all produce more to feel powerless and vulnerable about. You cannot focus upon the conquering of disease without giving your attention to disease. But it's also very important to understand that looking for cures for diseases, even when you find them, is a short-sighted and in the long run, ineffective process because as you have pointed out, new diseases are continually being created. When you begin to look for and understand the vibrational causes for diseases, rather than looking for cures, then you will come to the end of the pile of diseases. Would you please reread that last sentence? Mm-hmm. When you begin to look for and understand the vibrational causes for diseases, rather than looking for cures, then you will come to the end of the pile of diseases. When you're That's able to deliberately accomplish the emotion of ease and its accompanying vibrational alignment, it is possible to live disease-free. You know, this reminds me of the whole idea where people will treat a symptom. I mean, it's basically the same thing, right? Looking for cures instead of looking for the vibrational cause. Mm -hmm. It's like when, when you have a headache and someone says, well, just take this pill and the headache goes away. It's like, no, I want to figure out what's causing the headache. Is it a food allergy? Then I, then I can cure the, then I can, you know, cure the headache and up here looking for cures. I think that's really, um, they're not looking at what's causing it. Well, that's a, that's the interesting point. That's why I wanted you to re- reread that one sentence because that one sentence summarized the difference between what Abraham teaches us and what scientists teach us. What Abraham says is when you begin to look for and understand the vibrational causes for diseases rather than looking for cures, then you will come to the end of the pile of diseases. What science tells us is when you look for and understand the physical causes for diseases rather right. than looking for cures, then you will come to the end. There's a big difference there. Yeah. Science looks for physical causes. Abraham says look for vibrational causes. Mm. Powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a big difference. Very big. And they kind of work hand in hand. They do. It's not like one is exclusive from the other. Yeah. But, but it shows how we need to broaden the perspective a bit. 
most people spend very little time basking in appreciation for the wellness they are currently experiencing. But instead, they wait until they're sick, and then they turn their attention to recovery. Good feeling thoughts produce and sustain physical well-being. You live in a very busy times, and you find many things to fuss and worry about. And in doing so, you hold yourself out of alignment, and disease is the result. And then you focus upon the disease and perpetuate more disease. But you can break the cycle at any time. You do not have to wait for your society to understand in order to achieve wonderful physical wellness for yourself. Your natural state is one of wellness. So That's what's... so powerful. Mm, I just, I want to read it again. Okay. Most people spend very little time basking in appreciation for the wellness they are currently experiencing. But instead, they wait until they are sick, and then they turn their attention to recovery. Good feeling thoughts produce and sustain physical well-being. You live in very busy times, and you find many things to fuss and worry about. And in doing so, you hold yourself out of alignment, and disease is the result. And then you focus upon the disease and perpetuate more disease. But you can break the cycle at any time. You do not have to wait for your society to understand in order to achieve wonderful physical wellness yourself. Your natural state is one of wellness. So There's to, so much good stuff there. <laughs> well, so to, to, let, me, let me find a way to summarize it and kind of tie it together. In the first section, we were differentiating between looking for vibrational causes and physical causes. And we're recognizing it's really important to look at the vibrational causes. Now in the second section, they're giving us a very direct clue about what you do when you're looking for the physical, for, for the vibrational causes. What can you do to fix a bad vibration? They said it very clearly. Spend more time appreciating wellness. Most people spend and very little time basking in appreciation for the wellness they're currently experiencing. Well, why not spend more time on wellness? Why not spend more time appreciating it? Right. And appreciating the wellness they are currently experiencing. Yeah. I mean, even if, you know, like we talked before about, you know, well, my, my arm hurts, but my other arm's fine. Yes. Right. <laughs> right? It's like, it's like, we're all, we're all experiencing some level of wellness. Yeah. If we, if we don't have any level of wellness, we're dead. Right. That's a, right. Exactly. That's it. So like there are things, even when we are in, pain in an area of our body, we still have other parts of our body that are working well. Even if we have one organ that's not functionally functioning optimally, we have other organs that are functioning well. So it's appreciating. It's not that we ignore the things that we want to improve, but that appreciation for the things that are working well, I think is really powerful. And I love that it says this, you know, that when we when we find things to fuss and worry about, we hold ourselves out of alignment. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking like a lot lately about alignment first. Right. And when we fuss and worry and complain, we hold ourselves out of alignment. It's like, let me move over here where I'm not in alignment. Yes. And why would we do that? <laughs> Because we do it by habit, because we're used to, because that's our normal way of doing things, which, right. by the way, has a whole lot to explain about why it is we have so much dysfunctionality, we have so much stuff that we don't like, we have so much disease, we have so much aging. Guess what, guys? We're the ones doing it because we keep focusing on stuff we don't like. That's why do right. we do it? Well, it's almost, it almost doesn't even matter why we do it. We do it. Why not change the pattern? Well, once we once we're aware of it, that's when there's the question of why would we do it? Why would yeah. we do it knowing, now knowing, having <laughs> oh, yeah. this knowledge? <laughs> yeah, we just right? took away the excuse, right? <laughs> right, exactly. So here's the part I was excited all morning to actually really get to. Okay. Um, I've witnessed my body heal itself naturally because remember the last sentence of the last little section was your natural state is one of wellness. Right, right. So Jerry says, I am aware early in my life I'm sorry, say that again. I became aware early in life that my body heals quickly. If I cut or scratched my body, I could almost watch it heal right before my eyes. Within five minutes, I could see that healing had begun. And then in a very short time, the wound would be completely healed. Abraham says, your body is made up of intelligent cells 
that are always bringing themselves into balance. And the better you feel, the less you are vibrationally interfering with the cellular rebalancing. If you are focused upon things that are bothering you, the cells of your body are hindered in their natural balancing process. And once an illness has been diagnosed and you then turn your attention to that illness, the hindering is greater still. Let me stop you. Very first sentence, your body is made up of intelligent cells. Intelligent cells. Mm -hmm. I think I could just as easily change the word intelligent to conscious, to mm -hmm. self-aware. And when I think about it that way, I realize it's not just me. I have an entire army on my side. All I have to do is just ask them for help. All I have to do yeah, is just say, I want to be healthy. I want to be well. Help me make that happen. And I got literally millions of cells saying, yes, sir. Oh, here we go. Send out the orders. We're going to heal this body. And that it's our natural state. It's our natural state. Those cells' natural state. It's, it's always what our body is trying to do, right? It's, I love that idea that every symptom is a healing gesture. Our body is always moving towards healing, Yeah, well, towards how nice, wellness. How nice to know that it's not, just, it's not just nature. I mean, saying just nature is probably uh, inappropriate anyway because it makes it sound so minimal. But it's not a just thing at all. It's a great thing. We have this tremendous resource at, available to us. It's very powerful. It's conscious. It, 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 and it is a, a collection of conscious entities. I mean, based on what Abraham has taught us, everything is alive. Every aspect of our bodies is alive. Well, that means it's not just one person. It's a whole bunch of us who are all working together toward the same end. And, so and not just a lot alive, of but... There. Conscious and intelligent, right? Conscious, intelligent, able to do yeah. things, able to understand, able to have wishes. Like, whoa, this is this is a lot of power going on here. Why not it actually says, align with it? Since the cells of your body know what to do to come into balance, if you can find a way of focusing your attention upon good feeling thoughts, you will stop your negative interference and your recovery will come. Every dis-ease is caused by vibrational discord or resistance without exception. And since most people were unaware of their discordant thoughts prior to the illness, usually making little effort to practice good feeling thoughts, once the illness occurs, it is very difficult to then find pure positive thoughts. But if you could understand that your thoughts and your thoughts alone are causing the resistance that is preventing the wellness, and you could turn your thoughts in a more positive direction, your recovery could be very fast, no matter what the disease is and no matter how much it has progressed. The question is, can you direct your thoughts positively regardless of the condition? Usually at this point, someone asks, but what about the sick child who has just been born? Do not assume because a child is not yet speaking that the child is not thinking or offering vibration. There are tremendous influences to wellness and sickness that occur even when the child is still in the womb or is newly born. There it is again, the extreme example. You know, we, we, had, we had a good focus going on, and even Abraham goes to the extreme example because that's where they're led to so often by their physical friends who are asking questions. But it's an extreme example, folks. How about going back to the stuff that came before that? The previous paragraph said, but if you could understand that your thoughts and your thoughts alone are causing the resistance that is preventing the wellness, and you could turn your thoughts in a more positive direction, your recovery could be fast. No matter what the disease is and no matter what it is, how much it has progressed, the question is, can you direct your thoughts positively regardless of the condition? So I want to propose something here. How about we give up on extreme cases? I mean, it's not like extreme cases dominate our lives. Most of our lives are actually pretty good. So, you know, let's put the extreme cases aside and say, hey, I can control my thoughts. All I have to do is do it. And if I do it in a way that focuses on my wellness instead of my sickness, well, first of all, I'm a lot less likely to become sick. And second of all, I'm a lot more likely to be able to help somebody else who's sick because I can give them a guide just by saying, hey, follow what I do. Do my thing, because then you can get healthy, too. Why not focus on wellness? I mean, Louise, my wife, was, was talking. She talks about this, actually, fairly often, how we have a, a 
medical center. Most people have a medical center nearby. Ours is called the Yukon Medical Center, University of Connecticut. And we notice regularly how it has grown over the last 20 years that she and I have been together. When she and I first got to, together, it was 1998. And it was, I would say, about a third of its current size, physically. It has expanded monumentally in huge amounts. And they call it a wellness center. And it's full of sick people. And all the people who are inside are focusing on the sicknesses. And I'm thinking to myself, and Louise is thinking to herself, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Why is it that we have all this sickness increasing in a wellness center? Because we're focused it? on it. Because we're focused on it. There it is. Well, here's an idea. How about wellness being focused on as wellness rather than as what we're sick with? Why not focus on the feeling good part, on the part that we're healthy, on the part that you know we're getting healthier, on the part that you know our our bodies heal well, that we're able to heal, that just by staying with consciously positive thoughts, thoughts that we like, thoughts that feel good to us, we heal. What a concept! Well, I love that. I love this concept <laughs> because it's so important to remember, regardless of how small or how big, you know, we're perceiving the injury or the disease or whatever um, to be that our body, our natural state is wellness and our body is always moving in that direction. And I love that it started out with Jerry talking about when he was very young, he would notice how fast he would get a cut, a little cut or a scratch and notice how fast it would start to heal. Right. Um, that's a reminder that I use with myself and, and with clients um, all the time, whenever there's a, a physical malady that's being addressed and wanting to be, you know, overcome is that we have to remember that we've all had the experience of, you know, as a kid skinning our knee or scratching our hand or whatever. And, see how fast it heals like it immediately goes into healing mode because that's what our body does our body's propensity is toward healing and i think that that is that's the pivot it is, is when we're you know how abraham just said it's very difficult once the disease has been diagnosed once the person is suffering with whatever it is it's very difficult at that point to start finding, you know, those pure good thoughts. Um, but that's where you start is with that pivot and recognizing my body is powerful. Mm -hmm. My body is always wanting to feel better. My body's propensity is toward healing. My body automatically starts to heal itself when something is out of balance. That's the pivot, right? Yeah. And the only reason it's difficult, by the way, when, when you already have the condition, why is that difficult at that point? Well, two factors. Number one, because we keep focusing on it. <laughs> there it is. The condition is still there. It hasn't gone away. Yep, still there. Just checking. Yep, is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. By the way, it's still there. <laughs> well, and that's, and that's, that's the one factor. And then the second factor is we've done that so long, we build up a momentum about it. So wow. now we've got this huge momentum, this, this vibrational momentum that's, that's saying to us, oh, yeah, I've got more of that condition, more of that condition, more of that condition. Well, that combination is going to be – it's going to take a while to overcome that because we have a lot of mental shifting to do. And the point is we can do it, but now we understand why it takes longer because we've got these two factors that we build up against us. Well, and the issue of pain. <laughs> oh, pain, Yes. I mean, when we're in pain, um, it's that's where our focus naturally goes. And part of that's actually a good thing, right? Like when we, if I touch a hot stove, it hurts. I'm wired for pain. Oh, yeah. Because I need that information because I need to know, don't touch that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, so pain gives us information. It's vital and, information. It's information that keeps us alive, by the way. Right. And so, you know, there, there's that aspect of it. There's a positive aspect to it. There is. And yet it also draws our focus because when we're hurting, that it's hard to think about other things. And <laughs> yeah. so this is why it's so important to appreciate our 
well-being now. That's right. Love so the, so we don't have to deal with, I mean, pain is basically the two by four to the side of the head because we weren't listening the first 25 times. Ooh, well, I say that a lot that, you know, the, our body is so smart and we often don't listen. Yeah. And if we don't listen to that very small inner voice and then we don't listen to our body's really small whispers then they become louder and then they become a shout. And that's when that's when we have to go to the, the chiropractor or the emergency room or wherever because we're in pain and we have to listen. We have to tune our awareness to where we're paying attention. And it's not, you know, it takes focus. All of this stuff, all of this stuff, it sounds easy, but like we talked about at the beginning of the show today, it's like, we have all this knowledge, but we have to implement it. Right. We can talk about it all day, but we have to we have to implement the, and use the tools that we have. Yeah, at some point just... we have at some point we have to put the car in gear. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise we're not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> right. So let's see. I like this. I don't want to get into a section that we can't finish because we're we're kind of winding up here. Yeah, we probably let's see, well is it is it a fairly long one? Yeah, we just, well, we, we might be able to do it. We'll have to be quick with it. It's um, a good thought. By attention to wellness, I'll maintain wellness. All right, let's, let's go for it. it. Jerry says, because I've seen my body heal and because that healing has been visible to me, I expect that. But how can we get to the point that we know that all parts of the body will heal? People seem to be most frightened of the parts they can't see, those hidden inside the body, so to speak. Abraham says, it's a wonderful thing to see the results of your thoughts out in the open in an obvious fashion. And just as your wound or sickness is evidence of misalignment, your healing or wellness is evidence of alignment. Your tendency toward wellness is much stronger than your tendency for illness. And that's the reason that even with some negative thinking, most of you do remain mostly well. You have come to expect your wounds to heal which helps tremendously in the healing process. But when the evidence of your illness is something you cannot see, where you must rely on the investigation of your doctor who uses his medical tests or equipment to probe for information, you often feel powerless and fearful, which not only slows the healing process, but also is a strong reason for the creation of illness. Many people have come to feel vulnerable about the unseen parts of their bodies and that feeling of vulnerability is a very strong catalyst in the prep- in the perpetuation of illness. Most people go to the doctor when they're sick, asking for information about what is wrong. And when you look for something wrong, you usually find it. The law of attraction insists on it, actually. A continual searching for things wrong with your body will, in time, produce evidence of something wrong not because it was lurking there all along and you finally probed long enough to find it, but because repeated thought eventually creates its equivalent. I continue to be amazed at the rule that a belief is a thought that we think over and over again. It doesn't matter what the belief is. It doesn't matter how nonproductive it is. It doesn't matter how counterproductive it is. A belief is a thought that we think over and over again. So if we keep believing that there's going to be something wrong, we'll find it. <laughs> It's just so amazing. I, it is amazing. And I'm I'm so encouraged now to appreciate my level of well-being. Yeah. And to appreciate all the things that are working right and to appreciate that my natural state is wellness and that my body is so smart and that it's always working towards bringing me into balance that all of the cells know what to do. Absolutely. I think that's so powerful. <laughs> and I appreciate, and I have to say, I appreciate the fact that you're a part of the team here and that uh, I get to talk to you twice a week. I, my only regret is I don't get to do it for another six days, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, we'll, I'll be back with you next week. Well, that's a good thing. I, and I hope that you join <laughs> us as well. And and by the way, you know, tune in for all the podcasts because we're doing 11 of, of them a week for you and we want you to be a part of it. So please join us next time here on LA yes. Today. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. 